ありがとうございましたえっ、ー、と稼ぐ美徳っていうテーマだったんですけどあのさっきの話だと自分の人生で最高に生きることに頭を詰めた人が、まあ、今稼いでるでみんなそういう人生を送りたいと思っているけどもそういうものを追い求めない人と追い求めた結果成功する人がいるとでそこの違いの思考だったり思想は何かっていうのを。So, you're making an assumption that everybody wants to make the best of their life. And, and I don't think that's necessarily true. Or at least, I don't think that a lot of people think about what will make the best of their lives, because we're not taught to do that. We're not taught to think about ourselves. So, my mother, when I was growing up, told me, think of yourself last. Think of other people first. That's what、uh, most of us here in Japan are taught to. Everywhere. Yeah. Everywhere. Think of others first. Think of yourself last. I taught my children, think, big emphasis on think, about yourself. Think about what kind of human being you want to be. Think about what career you want to pursue. Think about what life you want to live. But if we don't teach that to people, they don't know how to do it. So they have all these obligations to family and to society and to the community that they think are the most, that they've been taught are the most important things for them. And they're busy doing that. And very few people stop and say, I want to live a great life. How do I do that? Now, what happens at some point in America, I don't know about, about here, is that you know, they, they feel unhappy. So they go to the bookstore and they find self help books, right? And there's a huge section of self help books. Which, but none of the self help books actually teach you to think about your life. They're very superficial. You know, do this, do that. They don't go to the core of it, they don't challenge the fundamental moral question. Of what is the purpose of your life? And I'm saying the purpose of your life is to flourish, is to live a great life, is to be happy. But nobody, you know, we take happiness, yeah, we all want to be happy, but nobody takes it seriously. The science of happiness, how do we become happy? What are the steps to being happy? And, and, And nobody challenges the idea that morality, so we, we live in this conflict. We want to be happy. We have all these self help books that teach us supposedly how to be happy. But morally, we're supposed to sacrifice. And all our moral heroes are people who sacrifice for other people. They weren't happy. Have you ever seen a painting of a saint with a smile on their face? Have you ever seen a happy saint? No, the definition of a saint is somebody who suffered. They usually have arrows sticking in all over the place, or they're crucified or something, right? At least, again, in the West, right? So, how do you combine that view of life, of sacrifice as good, with I want to be happy? Then you get guilt, and you get conflict, and you get, you, you get you know, this ripping apart, right? What Ayn Rand, I think, provides is really a science. To how to be successful. She says, no, you shouldn't sacrifice. Pain, suffering, that's not what life is about. It's not about the arrows, it's not about being crucified. It's about living, it's about enjoying life, it's about finding the things that, that, that really enhance your life. And then people say, well, you know, what about lying and stealing and cheating? Doesn't that make my, you know, doesn't, don't people become rich by lying and stealing and cheating? And she says, No. Just look at liars, people who lie all the time, people who cheat all the time. They don't have happy lives. They might have a lot of money, but they don't have happy lives. They can't live with themselves. Some of them go to jail. That's not very happy. So, when you teach your children to think about their, their, themselves first, it's not the same as putting your interest, self interest, ahead of others? Well, in a sense, it's putting your self interest ahead of others. I care about myself more than I care about you guys. That's reality. I care about me more than I care about you. 
and you care about you more than you care about me. And I get, this is the test I always give. And this is, this is a test that works even for the most altruistic, collectivistic people. I say, two kids are drowning. One of them's yours, one of them's the neighbor's. Who do you say first? Your own. Everybody saves their own child first. And I'm proud of that. Most people feel guilty about it. Because according, according to the morality out there, you should sacrifice. You should save the neighbor's kid and let your own kid drown. But no, we save our own kid first. Because the fact is we do, at some deep level, care about ourselves more. But then we feel guilty about it. I say, why the guilt? But that's different than saying, in order to pursue my self-interest, I'm going to destroy you. I'm going to sacrifice you. I don't care about you. No. Ayn Rand said, you shouldn't sacrifice to other people, and you shouldn't ask other people to sacrifice for you. The way to deal with other people is what she called the trader principle. What you want in life are win-win relationships. Did you say trader principle? Trader. Trader. From trading. Win-win. So think about a trade. When I buy an iPhone, I pay, I don't know, $300 for this. How much is it worth to me? More than 300 Otherwise, I wouldn't have bothered. So I'm benefiting from, I give up $300, I get something that's worth more than $300. How much is it worth to Apple? Less than $300. They're making a profit. So they won, and I won. Win-win relationship. Trade is win-win. At least we enter trades with the intention of win-win. Sometimes we make a mistake, right? But we enter the trade with a win-win intention. All human relationships should be like that. Your love relationship, right? Friendship, love. You want it to be win-win. If one party is sacrificing to the other, not going to last very long. And love, think about love. Love is the most self-interested of all emotions. Why do you love somebody? Because they make you feel good. Because they're a projection of your values. And yet, we're taught that love is selfless. Really? So imagine the, the day before your wedding. You go up to your spouse-to-be, and you say, I'm not getting anything out of this. This is completely selfless. This is a massive act of sacrifice. I'm marrying you as a sacrifice. I mean, she'd slap you in the face and walk away. The whole point of getting married is because I love you. You make me feel great. Right? So the very concept of selfless love is a misguided one. Yes, love, there is no such thing as selfless love. You can be selfless and you can love. You can't combine the two. And being selfless is hard. We, we need to be trained to be selfless. But that's what our educational system does. It tries so, to train so us to be selfless. So the educational system, the whole society is teaching us yes. to be more selfless, Why? more selfish. Why? Who has an interest? in us being selfless? Who has an interest in us sacrificing? Who has an interest in us caring more about other people than ourselves? Those that don't want to produce. Yeah, but, but I, those who don't want to produce don't have power. What's that? Whoever demands a sacrifice. Whoever demands a sacrifice. And who demands a sacrifice? The guys who have the power. The, the chief of the tribe the witch doctor of the tribe. Right? And this is the, this is the gimmick, right? You should live for the tribe, for the public good, for the common interest. And I say, but I don't know what the public good is. What, what, what do you mean by the common? Don't worry. I, as head of the tribe, I am no. I channel. I commune with the spirits. To, get, to tell you what the common good is. I know what's good for the tribe, so follow my orders. Altruism, the idea of living for the sake of other people, the idea of the, the, the primacy of the group over the individuals, are the way in which we are controlled by the people who want to control us, by the power lusters, 
by the dictators, by the witch doctors, the witch doctor being the religious leaders, because they are the only ones who know what true is, what right is. And then we need to follow. Right? And God forbid you be an individual, because you might challenge them. And this is why they always burn at the stake, the innovators. They always, they always destroy the independent thinkers, because they are a challenge to their authority. Individualism, this is why individualism comes out of reason, because the idea is that it's not the platonic philosopher king who reasons, right? According to Plato, only some people, the philosophers, know the truth. We all live in a cave. We only see shadows. We don't see reality as it really is. So we need the guidance of the experts, the guidance of the witch doctors to tell us how to live. And that serves the interest of the witch doctors. It serves the interest of the philosopher kings or the kings. What reason does, what Aristotle does, is he shatters that. He says, we all have reason. We all see reality as it is. We don't live in the cave. We don't see shadows. We're seeing the light. Every one of us can reason. So we don't need the witch doctor. We don't need the king. We can live our own lives. We can choose our own values. Suddenly, we're individualists. So Aristotle shatters the collectivism of Plato. There's a, there's a wonderful book called The Cave and the Light. The Cave and the Light, published a couple of years ago, which shows a point that Ayn Rand made a long time ago. But this is the first book to really illustrate it, if you will. It shows that all of the history of Europe and the West is really a battle between the ideas of Plato and the ideas of Aristotle. The ideas of collectivism and and, and, and the, the idea of the philosopher king, the idea of the abstract ideas that only some people commune with, and the ideas of reason and individualism, that is the struggle. That has always been the struggle. Who is and Ayn Rand, uh, of course, is on this Who is chair. the author of the book? You know, I don't, do you remember his name? Arthur Herman. Arthur Herman. Very good book. Highly recommended because it shows this contrast. And it actually has a whole section on Ayn Rand in the book where he places Ayn Rand on the Aristotle side, on the side of reason and individualism, where she belongs. But that's the battle. That's the battle we're still living. That's the battle, in a sense, we will always live. What we hope is that Aristotle wins. When he does, you get a renaissance and enlightenment. Well, if this is the situation that we're in right now, this brings another point. You've talked about the trend into mysticism, but in your latest book, I know you talk not only of mysticism, but this is only one part of a, of a trend that you have traced. And you call the mystics the witch doctors, as I remember. Okay. And you also talk about the rule of force and the men of force, the atlas of the world. So That's how right. do they fit into your, your framework? Well, you see, in fact, reason is man's only faculty for perceiving reality. Reason is the only means by which man can achieve knowledge of reality. And by reason, of course, I mean the faculty which perceives, identifies, and integrates the material provided by man's senses. Therefore, reason is man's faculty for perceiving reality. But reason does not work automatically. Men have to decide, will, to think, and to perceive. Men can uh, receive sensory data or integrate uh, uh, sensations into perceptions automatically, but they cannot form conceptions, they cannot form abstractions automatically. That has to be evolutional function of man's consciousness. And since most men, guided by their philosopher, do not wish to think, and they consider thought and reason either dangerous or impotent or too much of an effort, most human cultures, with very rare exceptions, have been ruled by what I call witch doctors. Oh. And a witch doctor is any man who takes his emotions, not his thinking, but his emotions, as his tool of cognition and his guide to reality. He functions by means of faith. He uh, acts on the basis of blind beliefs, which in fact are nothing more than his wishes. Mm. He is guided by his wishes, by his whims, which he takes as a guide to reality. 
no matter on what level of culture you observe him, that type of man is a witch doctor in the sense of his psychoepistemology, of the way he uses his mind. And since he has to deal with other men, since on the ground of emotions no one can deal with reality nor with people, the natural ally of the witch doctor will always be the type I call Attila, that is uh, the primitive, savage, tribal chief, the man who acts only on the range of the moment, on his immediate sensory perceptions, who is contemptuous of and refuses to consider ideas, principles, or abstractions, and whose way of dealing with reality and with other men is by means of brute force. Attila is either the gangster or the dictator or the military conqueror or any man who believes that force is practical, any man who refuses to think and wishes to loot, enslave, or force others. All through history, all major cultures, with very few exceptions, were ruled by an alliance of the man of faith, that is the witch doctor, with the man of force, which is the Attila. The witch doctor provided the goal and the values and the moral sanction for Attila to enforce in the world. And in today's world, you see the same phenomenon in allegedly civilized terms, but the essence remains the same, a dictator, which is the Attila, a man like Khrushchev, and his political theories, the modern, leftist, liberal, socialist intellectuals, who are philosophically Attilaists. They, in effect, provide an allegedly non-mystical moral justification, a philosophical justification for Attila and for the rule of brute force. I call them the neo-mystics, because they are as much against the validity of reason as were the original jungle witch doctors. Well, I can see the relationship of what the, the mystic or the neo-mystic can give to the Attilas, but what, uh, why do the, the mystics need the Attilas? What is the relationship the other way? What does Why do the mystics? Yes. Uh, because the mystics, first, a motivating force is dread of physical reality. Since it is a man who holds his emotions above reality, who in any conflict between his feelings and the facts of reality will select his feelings and will abandon reality or deny it, uh, he cannot deal with reality at all. And his mysticism is a form of escape from the necessity to deal with reality or with facts. Therefore, he needs Attila as a protector. He needs Attila to save him from the necessity of dealing with facts, to provide his material livelihood, and to enforce his edicts on the victims. 